Hello, everybody. We're going to be doing a live taping of AutoLine this week, talking all about the coronavirus and how this may impact the automotive industry. Here's how we're going to be doing it. We'll have an official taping of the show. We're going to end that show. It'll go for about a half hour. I'll, I'll close off the show as if that's the end of the show, but stay put because then we're going to open up to your questions with these experts that we've got talking all about you, you know, the things that you'd like to get into. So even when I tell tell the audience, hey, that this this is the end of the show, uh, stay put, and uh, we'd love to have you guys all participate. We've got three experts here, and uh, we're going to have a lot of knowledge that we're going to get out of them. Okay, we're going to get going in just a moment. Welcome to a special live edition of AutoLine This Week, brought to you by RSM, providing audit, tax, and consulting services in the middle market automotive industry. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine This Week. We're doing it differently because of the coronavirus. We're going to be bringing on our panelists remotely, and we're going to be talking about the coronavirus and the potential impact that it's going to have on the automotive industry. And joining us for today's discussion include Michael Robinet with IHS Market, Jeff Schuster with LMC Automotive, and Haig Stoddard with Ward's Intelligence. And thanks you guys for joining us from the comfort of your home. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. You know, uh, I'm not gonna put the onus on you guys of making any kind of forecast because who knows what's going to happen. Nonetheless, I gotta believe that you've got a range of ideas, best case to worst case or something along those lines. Uh, Michael Robinet, why don't I throw it out to you? What do you think might happen with uh, the market right now? Uh, well, John, and I uh, hope everybody's staying safe these days. Um, yeah, certainly, John. If you if you stand back and take a look at it, we, we've there's there's a couple of elements to this. There's the there's the supply side. Can when can OEMs effectively get back into the facilities and have the proper supply chain, and you know safely build vehicles? That's kind of number one on the runway. Then obviously with what's occurred with the stock market and and all shelter in place and all those other uh, aspects, there's the supply there's the demand side. So you get the supply side and the demand side. And to be honest, uh, you know, neither there's, you know, we, we as three forecasters, and I'm not going to speak for the other two, but I can tell you uh, it's a moving target. And, and to, so if we were to tell you X, it's almost definitely going to be X plus Y or X minus Y. It, it really depends on a lot of variables that it's all new territory for us. And, uh, and again, uh, we've got a full capable team within IHS that does a lot of this work. I'm, I'm just really more looking at it from the supplier side. But to be honest with you, there's three areas, demand, supply, and then downstream what's gonna happen with, uh, with vehicle launches and investment and the, uh, how, uh, you know, how capable uh, from a financial perspective, suppliers and OEMs are gonna be on the other side of this. Yeah, uh, no doubt about it. We're definitely in a state of flux right now, and things will probably be different a week after this show airs. But Jeff Schuster, your thoughts on this? Best case, worst case, any ideas? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think when you look at it, um, I would agree with uh, with everything Michael said in terms of the just how fluid things are. Uh, you know, we've been looking at daily revisions, if not hourly revisions, to date. Um, I think from our perspective. Uh, you know, just looking at uh, at the the supply side and, and the shutdown announcements and the likelihood of essentially the entire uh, automotive operation uh, from a manufacturing standpoint being shut down for a period of time. I think that's where we're headed. Um, you know, we've we've just with what's been announced uh, through a, a few minutes ago and what we've heard uh, that hasn't yet been announced. We've taken out more than six hundred thousand units out of North American production just with a shutdown. I think the the bigger issue is uh, it, while I agree that I think these are the different levels and stages, looking at supply chain, looking at uh, production levels, I think ultimately demand is what's going to drive this, and we're looking at demand. You know that uh, certainly is going to take out a lot more than that. Uh, we're just from a range. Uh, you know we're down probably sub 15 right now for the year. Uh, 15 million units for the U.S. I think looking at a North American market, that's probably 
uh, off uh, anywhere between uh, 12 and 15 percent, and I suspect it's going to get worse. So I think the, uh, the industry is going to have to put the seatbelt on and probably should go with a five-point seatbelt uh, at least through the remainder of the year. Yeah, no kidding. A five-point seatbelt is really what we're going to need to be wearing. Hank Stoddard, same thing. I know you guys at Ward's uh, Intelligence track all kinds of sales and productions. What's your outlook? Mm -hmm. Well, the way I, I can look at it, I think, you know, Jeff and Mike, Michael hit it right on the nose. I can't argue with anything they said. Uh, so I backed that up totally. I, I kind of look at it from the point of view as, you know, yard markers. Uh, we could be, have a, a, we're going to have a bad year. We could have a very bad year. Or it could even be worse. You know, I, I think what we're, what we need to look at is things are going to keep getting bad until we finally see that maybe the coronavirus spread especially in North America, is starting to get under control. And then the second thing after that is how soon does consumer and business confidence uh, come back enough that we can start seeing uh, some return to normalcy over the, on the horizon. And how soon consumer and business confidence comes back is going to be determined and how, and how deep the economy is hurt. And that'll be determined going back, I think, to when do we come out of this lockdown mode and so forth? So I would have said coming out that we would have had to be back on the track or see something on the horizon by this summer for this year, even in the U.S. to just have a 14 or 15 million uh, sales volume and North American production volumes along the same thing. Now, including yesterday and I think the announcement of California going into a complete lockdown is a leading indicator it probably, as Jeff and both Michael kind of alluded to, is probably even going to start looking a little bit worse down the line. Wow, you guys are painting a bleak picture. Is there anything we can learn from what happened in China? You know, it all broke out in China first. They, they went into a big lockdown in the country. Now it looks like they're getting back up to speed. Uh, so maybe two months of disruption or something like that. Anybody want to jump at that one? Or what can we learn from China? Well, John, I think what's interesting is get, look at the different levels of the recovery in China. Yes, they're they're back, at least from uh, our economic staff. I uh, basically said that 90 to 95 percent of, of economic activity is back up and running, but the the five to 10 percent is actually small businesses that are only probably about 60 percent running. So the entire country is not moving back forward or not moving forward. They're satisfying domestic demand, which is which is weak and, and is, is starting to work its way through. But think about China from an export market perspective, especially not so much for vehicles, but definitely for the component side. So now that you've got a North America that's down, uh, essentially down for the most part, except for just a couple of facilities through later uh, this week and maybe a little bit in next week. And then Europe is essentially shut down. So the, the siphon of those components, at least within automotive, that slowed down substantially. So you've got the domestic demand and then the export demand. And so this will be sort of a double whammy for China. And uh, from some respects, our own market, we've already sort of experienced a little bit of the export declining and will continue to. And then we'll have to certainly have work to the domestic side. Yeah. Anybody else want to join in? Lessons yeah. from China? Yeah, I can jump in. I, I think, um, well, China and I think other markets, I think we can look at a lot of different tracks. Uh, Obviously, looking at China, and I, I think if, if you were to go back to when China essentially locked down, you know, massive uh, cities, multi-million uh, population cities uh, to, to try to get a hold of this, uh, I think there really wasn't a thought that assuming this spreads around the world that, that we'd be able to or would be even willing to do that. And now we're, we're seeing that in Italy. We're seeing that in Spain. We're starting to see that uh, in the U.S. as well. Maybe not to the level or to the speed that that happened. Um, I think the bigger issue, obviously, just from a uh, mortality standpoint, is is the ability China was able to uh, to get beds, uh, you know, the temporary hospitals up and running. Uh, that's obviously had an impact in Italy, the inability to do that. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you look a couple of weeks down the path, you can see us kind of getting to that state. <clears throat> the question is, was it soon enough to contain it? Uh, or will we continue to see this uh, progress a little bit further than what happened in China? I think the other thing that we need to look at with China, and you know, we're hearing reports. Um, one, can we believe the 
the case count that they're reporting now. Obviously, they have uh, restarted operations. Uh, our office in China is back in in the office, so they're no longer at home. Uh, so I think that's a good signal that uh, this that this can run its course. Uh, the question is duration, uh, and and I think you know we're we're still not at the full lockdown state across the country, and I think we need to get there uh, before we see containment uh, and be able to really put a, a full guise on this. Yeah, Hag, any thoughts on that? I would just reinforce what Jeff just said, and I think it didn't really start getting better in China until they got to the point of where they just went started locking down big lockdowns. And you look at South Korea, who comparatively speaking to other countries is doing really well, but it's because they attacked it early on, went into big lockdowns, and now they're doing pretty well coming out of it. I think it just means going to back to what I said about, I kind of look at California's lockdown as a leading indicator of things to come. Until we get to that point in the United States, where we're ready to do that, that kind of a lockdown, which means a lot more hurt the economy and hurt to the auto industry. Things are not going to get better. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Michael, you, you talked about launches. We had a lot of new product coming out this year. And uh, what's going to happen there? And, and moreover, l let me add a second one on and, and y'all can jump in. But let me start with Michael. How much work can you do at home? I mean, uh, clearly the line workers cannot, but can you do R&D work? Can you do our engineering at home? Uh, how's that going to impact the industry as well? So two questions there, product launches and how much work can you do at home? Uh, it, if you're a program manager, I have a family member who's a program manager within a, within a supply base and, and it's it could be limited. Obviously you need to test parts, you need to work through new tooling and that's something you can't do at home. There are certain aspects of jobs that you can do. I think all three of us, I mean, I can do a good part, probably 95% of what I used to do in the office, I can do here without that social, social interaction, which is important. Um, you know, it, it's it, these are some major, major issues. Let's get back to the launch issue. Um, there's kind of three waves that are going to occur here. First wave is, uh, can we effectively launch a vehicle, let's say in July? And there's a couple of big launches occurring in July. Uh, significant launches, by the way, that are occurring. Uh, one, one, a couple. GM's got a couple. Ford's got a couple. All the OEMs have something going on this year. Can you effectively get that done? And I know that is a major issue within the OEMs that they're prioritizing that. And then there's a couple of bigger ones towards the end of the year. So as some of the early work that we need to do to make sure that tooling is approved. We've PPAPed parts, we're ready to go, we've got pre-builds and all those types of things. Is that going to occur by the end of the year? And you can see you know, the possibility for some of that to get pushed out a little bit. Then you've got that second wave. And this is the lesson that a lot of us learned through 08 and 09, is that so the OEMs will launch a vehicle if they've cut tools. They, you know, It's kind of like the bread's baked, let's eat it. So they, they launch that vehicle. But then you back up and you take a look at launches that might occur in 22 and 23 and those are delayable and that's the second wave of what this might happen uh, might might occur here yeah i think just to jump in i, I think it's it would hard, be hard not to see delays in both of those stages uh i completely agree that uh, that that's likely what we're looking at even with the with a prioritization of these major launches uh you know with on the truck side of the business uh, profit makers that's uh, obviously the priority to get them out there uh, however, if dealerships aren't open, uh, that makes it tough to sell those vehicles, even if you're able to build them. And I suspect this is all working in uh, the synchronized lockdown that we're, that Haig mentioned that we would, I would expect to see as well uh, expand across the country. We're hearing it in Pennsylvania, New York, California. Michigan's probably headed that direction uh, very, very soon. So I think that's that, that can be expected. I, I think the other aspect of it is uh, certainly, if you look at the number of launches that were electrified, uh, and then I think look at that investment and push towards electrification that, you know, GM just had their EV day uh, to kind of look at at that point in time and look at where we are just uh, just a short time since then, and the likelihood that a lot of these programs uh, certainly could face delays uh, given where oil prices are and just given where demand is. Uh, hey, got anything to add? I would just jump in and say at the obvious, the deeper this goes, the worse that that aspect is going to get. 
And I would look at, again, look at the, the companies that are weak on the revenue side that are most vulnerable. I mean, we might be looking at, we're, we're probably looking at if this goes deep enough this year, cancellations and look around the world globally, all these EV programs that are going on at a Volkswagen and so forth, which is what we've all been talking about and looking at for over the next 10 years. What, what's going to happen with that and what's going to happen with the suppliers that have been trying to figure out what's going on gearing up for that kind of thing. If we all of a sudden have all this upheaval, cancellation, delays, things happening in 2025 instead of 2023. Yeah, no, that's a great point there. Hey, God, I throw this out to all of you. It, it seems to me that governments probably are going to have to push back deadlines for regulations with ZEV mandates, you know, mandates for mm -hmm. electric cars, probably fuel economy uh, mandates as well. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, we've already seen this out of Europe. Uh, we, we've already been reading where some of the lobby groups are going to them saying, listen, if you want us to survive, it was going to be tough enough to, to begin with. And now you, now you want us to meet these regulations, which are, as we all know, really ramping up this year and are going to be very problematic for the, for the industry from a cost perspective. So you would almost have to believe that that's number one on the runway for the industry is to go to government and say, yeah, we're, we may ask you for some money, but we're going to need some relief on, on the legislative and the regulatory side uh, to come out of this uh, hole. And maybe we can resume that discussion when we get through this and and uh, and we can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, Jeff, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think uh, you know, given given the stimulus that we're seeing out of the governments uh, with small business, with you know, all the way down to local governments with potential relief on utilities, on on uh, mortgage payments through the through the, the financial system, on car loans. Uh, the, this inevitably has to spill over to reg, the regulatory environment. And I think uh, Europe is a good signal that, that we'll likely see that around the world as well. Um, it just, it, you know, this is severe enough uh, that that would put a real, I think, constraint on the ability of the, the industry to, to come back if, if they're forced into that investment phase um, without really having a you know, revenue stream essentially right now to, to fund it. Yeah, Hague, I mean, with what you're talking about, painting a pretty bleak picture in terms of production and all that, it, it would seem that some sort of delay or postponement or move back on regulation is inevitable. Yeah, and I, I hate to keep being so negative about everything, but yeah. Hey, you got to be realistic. I, I think you have to in this case. And, and you know, Jeff and Michael, I think, hit it on the nose again. I, I think definitely in the U.S. I could see a... a, a, a a delay in, in, in the, even the 2025 regulations. You know, was act, that was actually something I hadn't thought of until you brought it up, but I think that's a good point. And, and you're right, that kind of stuff, as far as assisting business and the automotive industry, which is so important to the US and other countries, um, there is gonna have to be a hard look. Do we need to make, a, make these automakers uh, meet those standards? I guess it might mean we also have to look at uh, that we're going to have a lot more volume over the next five to 10 years of uh, internal combustion engines than maybe we thought a couple months ago. Yeah, great point. Uh, you know, it's got to be hard for the auto industry to even figure out how it's going to get back up to speed in terms of production. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. You know, what I'm thinking of is the, the bake ovens in the paint shops, in the assembly plants. I'm thinking even steel mills. You know, once you shut those things down, foraging ovens, it takes a while to get them back up to speed. As we're doing the show right now, it looks like the automakers are going to be closed for a week. That's what they're scheduled for. Uh, I gotta believe it's going to go on for a lot longer than that. Michael, how hard is it to come back up to speed once everything's been shut down? Um, and, you know, at an OEM level, uh, building vehicles, not actually, I wouldn't say wouldn't be that difficult, but I, but you are right when you try to kind of work your way down the supply chain and, and kind of that, that, that bumping along and making sure that you've got all the right components, steel, forgings, all issues. But I think another aspect is pretty important here, that the production side is actually going to be more impacted than the sales side. And let me, let me take a minute and explain that. As you, as you decline on sales, um, what are your, what's your average dealer going to do if my local Chevy dealer or my local Ford dealer or Toyota, they've got a certain amount of inventory. And as they see the sales volume decline or their shelter in place and people are slowly coming back, 
they're going to sell off of inventory. So really what happens in the industry is as your market comes down, you actually pull from inventory. And we have probably, what, over three and a half million units of inventory in the United States, maybe three, six. You could see that being pulled easily by half a million, 600,000. And so those are vehicles that would have been built in a regular market, but now are getting pulled out of inventory. So there's this sort of double whammy that, yeah, once we get up to production, yeah, let's start producing vehicles. And maybe it's a new vehicle. That's great. But if it's got lots of inventory, we're going to move from that supply side issue to that demand side issue. And that's going to be the real switch. Yeah. Hey, uh, you guys track uh, like production a lot at Ward's Intelligence. What are your mm-hmm. thoughts about it, once this gets over and it will end at some point, how long does it take the industry to get back up to speed? Well, if you'd asked me this a week ago, I would have been saying, well, I would have been giving you a scenario if we can get back on that. We look like we're going to be on track, you know, sometime in May or June and that there was a light at the end of the tunnel this year. I would have said the inventory picture itself would not look too bad because sales are right now are starting to slow sooner than production is. So in a sense, it was in a perverse way, padding inventory so far. But now I think we're looking at a big downturn in the second quarter. It's, there's gonna be in more of a bigger impact, at least in the third quarter. Um, I think inventory is, is going to start to dry up, but on the production side, like Michael said, I, I think on the production side, it's going to take a while for it to build back up uh, to where we, if we get back to demand of 15, even 15 million a year, if not 16 million a year in the sometime in the latter half of the year, I think that production side is going to have a hard time building up. And we're going to be at that point building 21, wanting to build 21 models, not 20 models. And I think there's a lot of other residual effects that we could get into later as far as buying behavior changes in buying behavior and so forth that might might have an impact on how much we are going to build up production and inventory. Once we get yeah, to yeah, I was just going to say, I think there's a lag, yeah. uh, no question about it, like uh, like like both uh, Michael and Haig has, have pointed out. Uh, and with it, you know, with it down, you know, I think, John, you're right. I, we're going to see these plants down longer than, than a week or two. Uh, I think that's really uh, just the tip of the iceberg to what internally is being planned at a lot of these uh, these OEMs right now and, and suppliers as well. Um, I think when you then look at it, uh, depending on how weak we get with demand and how serious this gets, um, you know, you could have that gap, but I, I think I think most of this volume is evaporated uh, from the rest of the year. Now we're talking about what does next year mm-hmm. look like? Because I think, uh, you know, this year is, it, mm-hmm. You know, whether we get back to 2008, 2009 levels, I think that's a plausible uh, path that we're on right now or, or you know, possibly even lower. Uh, it's just an, an unknown given the duration issue right now. Yeah, and, you know, and that's say, a good point. You know, the lag. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Tig. I was just going to say, yeah, and the longer that this goes on, I think the we're not, you know, we're not going to see that typical V-shape uh, rebound. No. It's going to be a, a, a short it's going to be a gradual re back to normalcy of 16 million plus uh, annual volume, which will probably go well into next year. There is one bright area in the auto industry, potentially. And Michael, let, let me start with you on that. GM and Ford uh, and potentially even Tesla have told the White House they might be ready to make ventilators and respirators and things like that. What do you think? Could they do it? Absolutely. Um Again, scores of smart people over there with a supply base. So they know how to make plastic. They know how to make electronics. They know how to make tubing. They know how to make assemblies. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of great people at, over at those companies. And they put their mind to it. They, you know, let's face it, companies like Ford help put man on the moon. Uh, why can't you hurry up and make uh, you know, components like ventilators and other PPE and, and other types of components, uh, or at least work with the supply base to help them move them along. I think it's all very, very possible. Yeah. What, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I would just say um, kind of STT, space tooling training. Uh, I mean, those are the issues. Uh, you, you obviously can't just reconfigure a, uh, you know, an assembly line to now make ventilators. Uh, but I uh, clearly, they have the manufacturing know-how. Uh, you know, as Michael pointed out, there's a lot of smart people involved. 
Um, it's not a question of can they do it. I think the question is, can they do it in a time when it will actually help and be needed? Um, and I, I don't know that we know the answer to that right now. Yeah. Same question. Hey, any thoughts yeah. on that? Well, I'm sure if they had to do it, they could do it in the auto industry. I guess if I was the person who was looking at the logistics and supply base, I might, I might look at other factories or other facilities that were building bike parts, yeah. medical parts, or something compatible to that, and see if I if it was easier to uh, transition those into building ventilators and mass and other like delicate medical equipment that might be before I went to a plant that was building Silverados and tried to convert it. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I don't think uh, the industry is going to retool assembly plants, engine plants, right. stamping plants, yeah. or anything like that. But and I will then, say this, this is my two cents, and we'll wrap up the show with this. There is a lot of really good makers in the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. I know skilled trades people in the UAW. I know techs that work at the car companies that can make anything. I mean, these people are amazing at their ability to take stuff and make stuff. In fact, a good number of them have almost complete machine shops in their own garages or basements, and they would love to plunge into uh, stepping in to help the country out in an emergency like this. <laughs> you watch. If the call goes out, these are the kind of people who would come up and volunteer to do this kind of work. You wouldn't have to tell them to go do it. But anyway, Michael Robinette, Jeff Schuster, Haig Stoddard, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, very grim, but I like dealing with reality. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's thank another you, side to this. Thank you, John. Okay, we're going to go with the chat right now. So any of you who have been watching live, uh, you've got three experts that you can ask any questions of. And while you guys get going, I'll, I'll throw something else out there. Uh, to, oh, no, we got a bunch of questions. Never mind. They, they've been waiting here. Let's see. Uh, Citizen 4 says, nothing moves units off the lot like 0% interest for more than just highly qualified buyers. And if OEMs can offer their current customers an upgrade for a similar monthly payment, bingo. What do you guys think? Uh, th there will be some consumers who are going to jump at these killer deals. Uh, I, I, let, let, let's kind of take that compartmentally a little bit. There's sort of three things that have to align for a customer to go out and purchase a vehicle. They've got to have the ability to produce, uh, to purchase. So, do they have uh, income and do they have access to capital and you know, have, and then the, do they have the want to go buy that vehicle? Yeah, maybe they they have a used vehicle or the vehicle they have is okay. And then there's the whole aspect of the consumer confidence. Do I have the confidence that if I buy that vehicle, I'm going to be able to pay it off? And I, I don't disagree. We're going to have Keep America Rolling and all kinds of other programs and 0% for 84 months and all types of things. But to be honest with you, I think consumers are going to stand back and say, do I really need that vehicle even if I get it for 0% financing? And I don't disagree, but but certainly the, the demand side is going to be a big equation here. Yeah, we, we've we've not none of us have experienced anything like this. And you can say that to everyone you know around the world. So I, I think to look at that, th there's really nothing historically, at least in our lifetimes, I should add, um, there's nothing historically um, that, that we can reference. You know, obviously the, it worked in the past. Uh, there's no question some consumers will jump and wait for those incentives and they are coming. They're already out there now. Uh, we're going to see a lot more incentives to, to try to get those numbers back up. But I, I think the reality is if, if you've lost your job and we are going to see a lot of job loss here, or you're concerned about losing your job, uh, or you just look at your 401k, and I advise everyone not to do that, but if you just do <laughs> any of those things, you're probably not gonna buy a vehicle unless you absolutely have to. So I think we've got to factor that into this as well. This was not a, <clears throat> not a financial or a temporary uh, shock as it appeared that it might be. This is something that, has, uh, some, uh, that can be long lasting, and I think we've got to uh, just take day by day at this point. You know, I think the uh, 
you know, we, we've already had a lot of job loss. A lot of it's like restaurant, hotel workers, that kind of stuff. Uh, the news is going to keep getting worse. I think more people uh, like in the salad and white collar workforce that have paid sick leave and health care are going to start wondering themselves, am I going to have a job by Christmas, if not, maybe not even at the end of this summer? And I think a lot of big ticket purchases are just going to be put off. They'll be it will it will induce some demand all these you know 90 days without payments and so forth but i think the mood is going to be that we're going to put off making any major decisions on putting out lots of money for cars yeah again anybody who would like to participate and submit a question you can put it in through the the chat room right there uh we've got uh a comment here from dan neal hello dan he oh, says dan uh, ban the internal combustion engine and avoid the drawdown of legacy. He says, what growth is there going to be in legacy car making? Oh, there's, there's still, uh, there, there's still a lot of suppliers and OEMs that are counting on, uh, the internal combustion engine and different variants of propulsion based off the ICE, uh, for uh, several, several years to come. So I, uh, while it may be grandiose to think, hey, we can just maybe this is a great opportunity just to stop all uh, ICE and go to EV. Uh, I, I think that you know, obviously the infrastructure, it just it just would never work. Um, and there's going to be that gradual transition. That transition may be pushed out a little bit. We got $25 oil now. Uh, at $25 oil, the, the equation becomes a lot different. And uh, the, in terms of the cost of ownership and such. So, you know, these are a lot of different factors that have to be worked in. I think even if you force the issue, um, as Michael said, the infrastructure, the, the investment, uh, we're, we're not fully up capacity wise. There's no way we could support that at, a, you know, at an, at an industry wide level around the world, let alone in the U.S. Hey, got anything to add? No, I could, I could only reiterate what they say. I will throw out one thing, though, one interesting that at least I thought was interesting. We had a story on our website yesterday that uh, in China, while the coronavirus was uh, was going on there over the last couple months, uh, they did have an increase in demand for low speed delivery autonomous vehicles over these last couple months. Yeah, very interesting. Kind of an yeah, impact I, that might have in the long run, those kinds of things. Yeah, right. It, it will. Uh, yeah, just to address Dan's comment, too. Look, there isn't even the battery capacity to make the electric vehicles that automakers want to make right now. You know, we've had, uh, what, BMW claim that there's a shortage of batteries. Uh, I think Mercedes has made the same claim. I'm not sure I totally believe their excuse. I, I, I think they're looking at sales of EVs, their EVs, and deciding to, to delay production of electric vehicles. But we certainly don't have the battery capacity just to ban the ICE and go all electric right now. Absolutely. Okay, Brett Schmidt says, General Motors just came off a lengthy strike that shut down production and reduced inventory. Do they now face a misbalanced inventory going into the second shutdown? Hey, let's start with you because you guys really track on uh, where inventory levels are. No, actually, I would say before before we got into this virus effect, GM's inventory was actually pretty balanced. So I think going forward, they're not any they're not any more out of whack than anybody else is going to be once demand and production starts drying up at. You know the way things it looks like things are going now. I don't think, I don't think inventory is going to be a problem going forward as far as drying up. It'll be how much inventory do you have left once things start to get better. And, and GM's not any really overall worse or better off than uh, anybody else is on the whole. Yeah. Any thoughts, uh, Michael or Jeff? Yeah, I was just going to say. I think with a with a pivot, um, just again in the last couple of days. You know, initially when we were looking at the the inevitable shutdowns or, or started hearing indications of these plants uh, expected to go down. It was a concern of, especially with GM, is there enough inventory? And I know they're looking at that internally. I think the reality is now that, now that we know, uh, you know, let's not pretend we're, we're in a recession, we're going to be in a recession. Um, we're likely to see a, a much stronger pullback in demand 
Uh, I think there could be pockets of problems, but I think overall, uh, at least for this year, it, it probably won't be an inventory problem. That may spill into next year, you know, again, kind of tying in uh, the lag issue. Um, there, there could be potentially some issues if, you know, if, those, if demand and supply aren't aligned correctly, uh, given that there is a lag. Yeah, Michael, what do you think? Is it, are you in a good position to have lots of inventory right now, or are you in a good position to have very little inventory right now? And I guess it depends if you're an automaker or a dealer as well. Well, if you're, if you're a dealer, you still got to carry it. Now, whether your flooring costs are zero or they're not going to be zero, you're certainly going to have to pay somebody to, to hold the vehicle. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, everybody's going to be looking at their inventory. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of like internally, all the, all the consumers right now, they're re examining, well, do I really, obviously I can't go on that trip. Do I really need to uh, redo my kitchen at the end of the year? Oh, I think I can delay that. And I think these types of decisions are going to find their way into automotive. I, I, we think this is this certainly going to carry over in the next year in terms of a lag effect. There's no doubt. And, and how do we emerge from this? Uh, and, and that timing is really, frankly, up in the air. The supply side is a big issue, big issue. The demand side is the one where that, that could really have longer lasting effects. Hey, we've got a good question here from John Public Profile. He says, how much of a differentiator will Tesla's online purchasing and delivery services be? Seems to me Tesla potentially has an advantage there. John, let me let me take that for a minute. We've gone from a 29,000 Dow to a 20,000. Okay, think of the wealth effect that's been impacted by that decline. We've had oil decline uh, substantially. Now, I think, again, if, whether this is Tesla or other uh, higher-end EVs, uh, you know, oil really had a, something to do with it, but not an awful lot to do with some of those decisions on purchases, to be honest with you. It was really more driven by wealth effect and the ability and the want to buy those vehicles. As you go down that far, you have to really question how robust that wealth effect demand is going to be going forward. So, you know, you take a look at lifestyle vehicles and, and, and those types of offerings. Obviously, the rental side is going to have a significant impact. Fleet has been pulled back uh, substantially. So there's different pockets of the market that are being more impacted. But but if you get to the EV side, you know, I think that it, it's there's going to be some real issues. There's no doubt. Yeah, I think there's a couple of issues there. One, uh, as Michael pointed out, the cost of, of the Tesla products uh, and, and how that might, um, you know, be perceived by a consumer that that did lose all of that in the stock market or potentially even lost their job or, again, is is concerned. Um, so, I th but I think if you look at, at that model that they have, they might have some advantages uh, over if you look at the general dealership population. However, I think it comes down to the individual dealers and not the individual brands at this point, um, because I, as an example myself, uh, and, and I don't own a Tesla, but the last four vehicles I've purchased, they weren't in the showroom. I had it dropped off at my house. So I, there are dealerships that are, are doing this and have been doing this for years. Um, but that's not widespread. Uh, it's definitely in pocket. So I think this likely will shift the industry to thinking in that direction and, and thinking in more uh, consumer, uh, you know, direct to consumer uh, sales. So we'll see how it all plays out. They may have an advantage over the overall industry, though, uh, when you look at it as a brand. Mm -hmm. Hey, anything to add? And say this might this might help put a accelerate a shift toward that, depending on how how strong, how bad demand or how good demand can stay. I think some dealerships are, they're actually already right now, um, you know, Chevy dealerships and dealerships like that are actually already uh, promoting some sort of uh, online type of, uh, of uh, window shopping and, and buying while people are, are stuck in their homes. So there's potentially it could accelerate that kind of a uh, kind of a movement just because some dealerships that weren't really doing it so much before, maybe now they're going to start to uh, get more practiced in it and start seeing that there might be some advantage in the long run uh, for doing that kind of uh, selling. Here's an interesting question from Jonathan Devansky. He asks, do you think the virus will kill off struggling brands like Alfa Romeo and Fiat in the U.S. market? 
It's certainly going to make life uh, a lot more difficult for some of those smaller brands, uh, excuse me, brands going forward, especially depending on where they are in terms of uh, luxury or mass market or niche, whatever the case might be. Um, I spend a lot, I and a lot of our team members also spend a lot of time on the supply base. And I think that, you know, the combination of uh, you know, lag effects from the GM strike and then the shift from, uh, you know, ICE to EV and some of the investment that's required there. And then you add in uh, some of this and then what might happen with credit markets as well. That's something we haven't even discussed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, th- there may be some suppliers that frankly uh, are, are, are going to have trouble making it through the other side. I'm not saying all of them or even are the majority, but there's, there's definitely going to be pockets here um, that we're already having problems as we, as we kind of moved into this. And, and there could be some, some real opportunities uh, out, out at the end of this for, uh, for you know, strategic buyers to come in and, uh, and um, pick up some interesting assets. Yeah, and I'd, I'd take it back to a, a global level and, uh, and then also local. So I think if you look globally, uh, not only could we see an impact like that affect brands that are struggling in the market here, but I think because this is not a, you know, a, a U.S. only issue, this is a global issue, we're, we're going to see we're going to see brands that are struggling in general uh, have a hard time, I think, uh, getting through this. And we could that could lead to uh, to brands uh, not remaining with us or consolidation. Um, I would agree on the supply base. I, I think all of you know these type of events tend to lead to to consolidation and and, uh, and outright uh, companies disappearing. And I think you could even look at it at the dealership level. I mean, the reality is we're probably not going to have all the dealers we have today uh, make it through this. Uh, and I think the industry is, you know, is going to have to prepare for that. And if we, if we get down to even in, a, in the U S if we get down to levels of sales that are, you know, 12, 13 million, even I, I would bet that there's going to be some sort of weaning out of, of brands. But I would even then, you know, take it to another another subject. I I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised to see capa- production capacity being taken out, even in North America. Mm-hmm. Even a lot of companies are are building more building close to 100 percent capacity. I think if we get down and it gets that bad, um, I think globally and in North America, we want even on the production side, we'll see we'll see some kind conden- of condensation. Yeah, Haig, I think just to, to add to that, I think um, that's a very good point because we were already looking at um, globally an underutilized situation around the world. And now you throw this on top of it, even if this is something that works itself out in, you know, in a 18 month to 24 month period, that's going to put a lot of pressure on that excess capacity and investment that uh, that essentially is unused right now. So we'll have to we'll have to keep a close eye on that as this progresses. Yep. Look at look at balance sheets. Look at uh, availability of credit, and so even if a company makes it through this, what do they do on the other side when someone is well better capitalized and they're able to really pounce and take care uh, take advantage of opportunities? So there's there's going to be a lot of strategy and competitive uh, aspects to this as well. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Casada S writes in to ask, how long does this crisis need to go on before the government needs to take over GM Ford and Chrysler? Well, I don't know if I'm going to touch that one with yeah. a 10 foot pole. Uh, yeah, I don't think we're there. <laughs> we're, not, we're, we're not there. I mean, these, these companies are at a different, uh, different financial position than what they were back in 08 and 09 the availability credit and all those other aspects. But, um, um, you know, one, one would hope that, uh, you know, the, the government has been through this a couple times. I mean, I remember uh, 1980 and 1981. Uh, again, I wasn't working in the industry, but, you know, government got involved. Uh, government got involved, obviously, in 08 and 09. Uh, so there's precedent for it. Yeah, uh, I, I personally, I don't think the government's going to take over GM, Ford and Chrysler. They might make financing available oh, to them and not yeah. just the, the car companies. I mean, this is going to be across corporate America. Mm-hmm. No, no question about it, John. This is, uh, mul- you know, affecting all industries. Uh, just look at aerospace, the airline industry. Um, you know, their hands are going to be out first, travel industry. Um, but expect to see something on the auto side, I think, if this goes long enough. Yeah, I, I know the automakers are, are pulling out all the stops right now. 
Uh, Ford just uh, tapped into a line of credit. I think its total liquidity right now is $30 billion. That's pretty good. My guess is GM's in an even better position than that. I'm not sure where FCA stands right now. Uh, uh, and we'll see how this might impact their potential merger with PSA, with Peugeot. If you stand back and look at it, I think it's important to understand who's got exposure to China. Because now, you know, GM... GM has very good exposure to China, so does Volkswagen, and they're crawling out of this. So that's very similar to 08 and 09 when China was the real harbinger of keeping some of these companies afloat, or at least the accelerant to help get them moving. So China can be really important here, and those OEMs that don't have exposure to China, uh, you know, with a really depressed European market, and certainly some of the situations we see here in the United States and Canada, uh, it, it's, you know, China is going to be pretty important. Yeah, and I think if you, you add on that, if you look at um, uh, look at a, a PSA and a, an FCA, both of them are are underperforming in China and have certainly issues with their op- both of their operations. So putting them together doesn't solve that. Uh, but it also, as China and let's assume China comes back um, to a level that can help support these other operations that are going through this in in Europe and in North America. Uh, they're not going to be able to participate in that aspect of it as well as uh, as a GM, uh, even a Toyota or a Volkswagen. Yeah. I would just throw out there that an FCA, other than the Ram right now, they're at a point right now where they're they're sort of in a lull, a fresh product lull. And even on a global basis, if we get back to what you know Michael was talking about before, to, I can't you know delays of programs and things like that. I look as an FCA and some of the other companies, uh, it's going to hurt them if they have to push back uh, some of those product, some of those programs, because it's going to hurt their demand, which of course is going to hurt their production and their, their factory sales revenue and so forth. So there, there's going to be that kind of a ramification too, where a GM and a Ford are in a pretty good cadence right now, if they can keep their programs uh, pretty much going. Yeah, uh, Haig, you had mentioned uh, these low-speed autonomous delivery vehicles seeing big demand in China. Sean Kadar wrote in to ask, do you think with everything that's going on, this will accelerate autonomous R&D and implementation? I I think, uh, I mean, I think from a need, uh, certainly in the delivery space, um, possibly, but I think the the reality is you've got to have capital if you don't have capital to invest in this, uh, the R&D is not going to happen. And I think that's probably at least the near term stage we're looking at is, uh, you know, you, you, John, you mentioned liquidity. And, and I think that's the name of the game right now is to get through this. Um, so I think once we come out the other side or we see what the what this um, trajectory looks like, then then I think we can talk about that. But I think right now everybody's hunkering down and uh, that's probably not the focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my guess is, depending on how bad this gets, and Haig, you painted some pretty bleak outlooks for us there. I I could see automakers slamming on the brakes when it comes to R&D expenditures. Oh, Certainly absolutely. in things like R&D that are a bit out there, nobody knows when they're going to make money on it. I mean, just chop it right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Michael, I mean, you were you, starting to say, yeah. No, I the, absolutely. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if your dad said, hey, we're going to go on a cruise. Hey, that's great. And then he decides, oh, we don't have the money. We're just going to go to the beach. And here's a pail. I mean, really, that's what's going to happen here. Uh, the, the OEMs have multi-stage uh, R&D going on, whether it be in battery or ADAS or, or fuel cell and some of those areas. And, and again, I don't know what's going to be ratcheted back, but you got to believe that Virtually every OEM is war rooming and saying, okay, if we get down to X, what are we going to do? And uh, it, just like most companies that I know, it's, and uh, on the supplier side, they're saying, well, we were thinking about developing this with this company and partnering here and here and here. I think uh, risk mitigation is going to be job one with uh, OEMs and suppliers, and they're going to they're retrench uh, depending on how bad this gets. If it doesn't add margin, don't do it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly right. Uh, B. Wilson on 4Web says, inside EV reports that the Tesla Gigafactory in China is producing 3,000 cars a week. 
long pause. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 so I'll jump in on that. Yeah, not uh, sure. I, I think it comes back to what uh, the three of you have been talking about. You know, production's one thing, demand, yeah, demand is another. Is other, right. How many Chinese consumers are going to be jumping up to buy new cars right now? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that in, you know, then you've got the issue in, in China as well of, of wholesale and retail and, you know, where that volume ends up going and, and waiting. And I think, um, you know, we're still at the early stages of, uh, of what could be, I don't even want to call it a recovery yet, certainly in the auto sector, because we, we've just pulled more volume out of China. And I think, you know, we look at a GDP growth that, that was in this high 6% range, you know, then it came down and the expectation was 4%. Now we're almost evaporated uh, from from a GDP level. So I think if you look at that for this year, uh, you know that those volumes they're they're going to have to sit somewhere. I don't think they're consumers for them uh, until we see a true recovery. Yeah. Okay, and uh, maybe we'll make this the last question. Brett Schmidt's back again, asking: Should Congress recreate the cash for clunkers program to help spur demand? And if so, how should they make it different? than the, the last cash for clunkers. Um, you know, having lived through that, I know the rest of the other two gentlemen did as well. Um, certainly it had a near-term impact on basically getting product off the lots and, and helping the OEMs to help replenish them, uh, some of that supply. But I'll, I'll, I'll get back to, do you need the vehicle? Even if someone gives you a couple bucks in your back pocket and 0% and financing, you still have to pay for the vehicle and you have to be gainfully employed. Do you have the ability and the want to get into the market? I think we have to be careful not to get too negative. It, and it's easy to kind of pile on and say, oh my God, doomsday and, and, and dearth and things. You know, we see a, uh, an end. We see uh, some sort of light at the end of the tunnel. But the issue is, we just don't know how far that light is, um, and we got to be careful not not to completely decimate the industry from when we do emerge, and how slowly or how quickly we might emerge at the end of that. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll try and be a glass half full type person and and say that you know we've been through this before. The 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 climb out will be U shaped. Definitely will not be V shaped. Uh, and we're going to have to get our sea legs under us to, to really emerge from this. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was just going to add, um, I, I think to just stay, stay in, in, end on a positive note. I think, you know, we saw this 08, 09, we saw, uh, companies emerge much stronger, uh, after going through everything. I, I think innovation is the other thing that tends to come from this. Just look at, look at what we're doing right now. This is innovation. I mean, we're trying to, adapt to the the situations we're all working a little differently um, i think it's going to lead to further innovation for the industry for economies around the world there will be some positive that comes out of this uh, it's hard to see it now but we just have to to get through it and uh, and look at the other side yeah hey final thoughts um, the only thing i would say on that is that i, I don't think there's any reason to do a, ca a cash for clunkers for one thing i'll the moment one thing it would do is just drain inventory faster if we did that, and and you know the other thing is too, and it, and it would be maybe more on a positive note is if we were going to drain anything, maybe we'd want to get rid of those two and three year old off lease vehicles, so that when the market does start coming back, uh, maybe there's more demand going to the new vehicle side, whereas you know while we're going through this, if anybody is making a choice that they're going to buy a vehicle. They're probably going to go more to the used side at the same. It, we may see even more of a move to the used side than what we have been recently. So, on the whole, I don't. I don't think there's any point to really do anything like that right now. Real good. Well, with that, we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank all of you out there uh, who have been watching this live broadcast and submitting your questions. Thank you very much, and of course, special thanks to Michael Robinet, Jeff Schuster, and Haig Stoddard. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a special live edition of AutoLine This Week, brought to you by RSM, providing audit, tax, and consulting services in the middle market automotive industry.